The Week in Doubt, religious news stories from a skeptical perspective, random musings on everything from pop culture to politics, and even audio documentaries on weird and interesting topics like Krampus and the history of the holidays. The Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. Hey everyone, I'm Phil Albertelli, the host of The Week in Doubt, and this is episode 334. You may have noticed that I tweaked the intro a little there. Uh, The music in my voice used to kick in at the same time, and I thought it might be kind of hitting people like a jump scare, so mm, made a little change. Now I let the riff play a little before I begin the voiceover. Okay. So I guess I'll take care of the obligatory Facebook shoutouts. We have Ben Davis, Stephen Harmon, Paul J. Grabelny, Jacob Mount, Eric McMillan, Ahmad Shahidi, Alan Scott Hegelson, or Helgeson, my apologies, uh, Richard Schloss, Durley Coria, Paul Rogers, Sean Durante, and Michael Famenia. I actually think that was technically more than 10, but hey, that's okay. And so also before we start, hopefully this is all right with the person, uh, a Patreon supporter sent me a very nice message. And uh, I don't have their explicit permission to read this on on the air, so hopefully they don't mind. Uh, Maybe I'll leave their their name out for now, just in case. Um, It's actually, I think it's a very positive message, so hopefully they won't mind if I at least read a portion here. So they said, I love the show. It's very unique amongst the other atheist slash secular podcasts. I particularly like your dedication and the research you do when you do a deep dive on a historical topic. I also enjoy your rants about health issues. It's nice to hear someone talk openly about depression as I work to overcome it as well. It appears we are both advocates for mental health treatment, awareness, and its destigmatization. I look forward to future episodes. And they also asked me to consider the possibility of implementing an RSS feed specifically for Patreon supporters. And honestly, I don't know anything about that, but I'll definitely look into it. I think my friend and fellow podcaster, C-Web, used to do something like that. Maybe I could even ask him. I I need to check in with him. We haven't talked for a while. I don't even know if he's still doing um, Paranormal Skeptic uh, Academy. I can talk. Uh, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, so just in general, it's always nice to hear from listeners and to get feedback, especially when it's positive. I also welcome constructive criticism. But yeah, it's it's especially nice to hear that people appreciate what you're doing. And this isn't just me trying to sound polite or, you know, blowing smoke. It really does mean a lot when I receive feedback, when I hear from listeners. In fact, If I never heard from listeners, you know, I might have packed the show up a long time ago. It's the assurance that I'm not just one guy rambling into a microphone and that there's people out there who are actually listening and getting something out of what I do that keeps me going. If it wasn't for that, you know, like I said, probably would have packed it in a long time ago. And if you're a long-time listener, then you're probably well aware of just how overly critical and self-conscious I can be when it comes to the quality of the show, etc. And that's why it always comes as this really pleasant surprise when I hear that there's people out there who actually like the more rambling, unscripted (laughs) episodes. And I think some of the early feedback I received, you know, when I first started the show is uh, I had people saying things like, you know, it's different than other podcasts. It sounds like I'm listening to someone think out loud. And I think it was listener Matthew Sharnweber who said before that there seems something more honest about listening to someone's thought process kind of unfurl and listening to someone come to the truth or come to a conclusion uh, in an unscripted way. 
And then the Patreon supporter there was saying in their message how they actually like to listen to me talk about my health issues, which uh, once again d definitely hit me as a pleasant surprise because I always feel like I'm whining when I do that. Or what do they say across the pond? Is it whinging? Uh, so maybe I'll give a brief health update since I know there's at least uh, one person out there who, <laughs> who will be interested in hearing it, you know? And so I'll try to be as concise as possible. So the last time I mentioned my health on the show, I was talking about how I, at the time I was taking Topamax, aka Dopamax, for my migraines. And regular listeners will know that I suffer from chronic migraines, and this may or may not be due in part to a couple of bad car accidents I got into in my early 20s. And it's always been something of a frustrating mystery to me, trying to suss out just how much are these chronic headaches hereditary, and how much are they in part due to head trauma, uh, you know, possibly sustained in those aforementioned car accidents. And I stumbled upon an interesting bit of information online not long ago. I was reading about how there's this fairly common phenomenon uh, among people who suffer from chronic headaches where it seems people who start off being somewhat predisposed to migraines. Uh, and, and when I was a kid, I did get the occasional classic migraine on a particularly rainy or overcast day, the type where you had to kind of crawl in the dark, crawl into the dark and wait for the pain to go away. But it wasn't until after those car accidents that they started to become chronic. And by chronic, I mean basically every day. And it turns out that apparently people who are already predisposed to migraines or headaches, when they experience head trauma, then the headaches will often go from, you know, whatever the rate of occurrence was before the accident to, to after the accident becoming chronic or daily. So that's probably what's going on with me. And in the beginning, they tried everything on me, you know, anti-seizure drugs, muscle relaxers, painkillers, and most of them either didn't work or they just made me too drowsy to function. I didn't really feel like myself. And the first thing to really work for the headaches was an antidepressant that's actually commonly prescribed for migraines called uh, amitriptyline. I think the brand name used to be, maybe still is, Elevil or one of the brand names. That was the first thing to actually start to, you know, lessen the severity of the headaches. And that led my neurologist at the time, this really nice guy who's now retired, to posit that, you know, maybe there's a serotonin component to whatever's going on or, you know, a serotonin deficiency of sorts. And most antidepressants, not all, uh, in general work by potentiating or preventing the reuptake of the neurotransmitter serotonin in the brain, the kind of feel-good uh, chemical that's also released, uh, you know, when you take MDMA or Molly ecstasy or whatever. It's kind of funny because I, I can remember in my early 20s, I've told this story on the show before, where I was just suffering daily with these horrible headaches, and I took ecstasy for the first time at a party, and the headache completely went away. It was like a new lease on life, one of the best nights of my life. Ironically, though, even though MDMA and antidepressants both work on serotonin, because there's different mechanisms of action, antidepressants can actually interfere with uh, an MDMA high, which I found out for myself uh, <laughs> during my club days. But anyway, getting back to the story. So my neurologist came to the conclusion that perhaps antidepressants were the best way to go for me uh, in particular. And one of the other things I liked that the Patreon supporter was saying in their message is where they were talking about the destigmatization of depression, uh, mood disorders, mental illness, that sort of thing. And I think that really is important. And, and this reminded me of something where... Uh, 
I was at a wedding back in my 20s, and there was a kind of, I guess what you would call now a frenemy there, who was also in the wedding party. And when the topic came up, how I was on antidepressants for headaches, he said really kind of judgmentally how, oh, why does everyone say that? I know so many people who take antidepressants and they say it's for headaches, you know, almost like implying that the person is lying or being dishonest because they don't want, they'd rather say it's for headaches than for depression. And so he was being kind of characteristically cynical or dickish. And what he, you know, probably wasn't aware of or that he wasn't factoring in is that there's a very good reason why there's a lot of people out there saying they take antidepressants uh, for headaches. And that's because antidepressants are legitimately often prescribed for, for headaches or migraines. And there's a couple of theories about why antidepressants seem to help people who suffer from migraines, other types of chronic headaches, chronic pain. In regard to migraines specifically, there's a theory that migraines are at least in part a vascular disorder. And it's thought that serotonin might play a role in the, regula in the regulation of um, blood flow in the brain. And another theory is that there's a link between serotonin and pain perception. And the higher the level of serotonin, the higher your kind of pain threshold or something like that. And, and of course, also, there's a comorbidity between a kind of overlap between people who suffer from migraines and suffer from depression. And you could posit that, you know, living in chronic pain could be conducive to depression. Or um, it, it's also thought that chronic pain can actually be a kind of manifestation or a symptom of depression. And if I'm going to be honest with you guys and myself, you know, I, I think I'd be lying if I were to try to claim that my only problem were the migraines. I think I do kind of exemplify that comorbidity or that overlap. When I was first prescribed antidepressants for the migraines, and I saw how they actually proved efficacious to some degree where other, uh, other medications didn't, I had this kind of come-to-Jesus moment, figuratively speaking, agnostic atheist here, <laughs> uh, where I was like, there's more here than just the headaches. You know, I have baggage and issues uh, that I've been carrying around for a long time. And so I took it upon myself to actually schedule an appointment with, you know, a behavioral health specialist and begin talk therapy. And it actually wasn't until recently that I, I ceased going to talk therapy. And that's only because there was kind of a shakeup in the behavioral health department, the clinic I go to, and the therapist I was seeing there retired. Um, so far, seemed to be doing pretty good with just the antidepressants alone, uh, you know, sans the, uh, the therapy. And I don't often pat myself on the back, but I still kind of look back in awe, you know, that I had the maturity in my early 20s to realize that there may have been deeper issues going on and that if I was going to take a psychotropic medication, I should also probably be talking to someone. Uh, I'm still surprised. Uh, yeah, I, I had the level of maturity to do that because when I look back, you know, in general, I think uh, I was kind of a, an emotionally immature individual back in my early 20s. And the nature of depression itself is still somewhat of a mystery. Even the experts are still trying to figure out just how much of it is cognitive, how much of it is chemical, you know, um, uh, nature versus nurture, etc. I mean, there's clearly a chemical component to depression. That's why antidepressants work. But there's still some unanswered questions. There's kind of, uh, you know, a, a chicken and the egg kind of conundrum. You know, does the chemical imbalance come first and that leads to the negative thoughts and emotions? Or do the negative thoughts and emotions come first and eventually that takes a kind of chemical toll and throws off your equilibrium and leads to some kind of serotonin and neurotransmitter deficiency? 
I personally think that it probably varies from case to case. You can have a person who's maybe born with a predisposition towards things like depression or anxiety. Maybe they have some kind of hereditary chemical imbalance. Or, you know, then you could have someone who maybe otherwise wouldn't really be predisposed to a mood disorder or something, but they had a really tough upbringing, uh, maybe, you know, a really rocky uh, home life or, or whatever it is. And they were exposed to constant stress and, and uh, emotional tumult. And maybe over time, that actually kind of throws things off, you know. And I imagine for a lot of people, it's kind of a combination of nature and nurture. And that's probably why the combination of talk therapy in conjunction with antidepressants works so well for, you know, a great deal of people. But I think no matter what the exact cause of depression is, uh, I don't think there should be a stigma attached to it or other mood or mental disorders for that matter. And I actually think it's incredibly inhumane to try to tell someone who's already suffering that they're weak or that they just need to man up or whatever, you know? And I believe it was YouTuber Wizard of Cause who made a video on depression a long time ago that I found really, really poignant. And he made the great point that, to the contrary of being weak, most people who suffer with depression, you know, they don't feel like getting up in the morning. Maybe they have these accompanying, you know, symptomatic aches and pains and all that. And they, most of them still force themselves out of bed, take on the responsibilities of the day, push themselves through the drudgery of a nine to five job, come home, you know, fall asleep, do it all over again. And it's interesting, you know, and I'm not trying to make this political or whatever, but it often seems like the more kind of conservative, pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps crowd that tend to kind of you know, thumb their noses at the idea of depression and posit the idea that's just people being weak or people who need more discipline or need to stop being, you know, such candy asses or whatever. But uh, ironically, Jordan Peterson, who is kind of, you know, a hero to a lot of people who lean right, uh, you know, at the moment. Uh, I don't know. Is Jordan Peterson still big? Uh, he probably is, I imagine. But Jordan Peterson talks openly about his own battle with depression and how much antidepressants, were, I don't know if he still takes them because he has that whole diet thing he does, but uh, he's open about how antidepressants helped him greatly over the years and helped keep him going. And if I'm not mistaken, he seems to imply that he probably has some kind of hereditary predisposition towards depression that runs in his family and that he thinks there's probably some kind of chemical component to his own depression. But yeah, so I gave that Topamax stuff a shot and oh man, I mean, I felt sedated. Like it almost reminded me of when you see a uh, footage of, you know, old mental hospitals with people shuffling around who are overly medicated or something, Thorazine or whatever. Yeah, I just felt so sedated that I was, you know, uh, I felt like I could barely function, but somehow I, I fought through and, you know, managed to work construction uh, every day or whatever. Uh, probably uh, thanks to a lot of caffeine and uh, Yohimbine or whatever. Uh, I think it may have helped my headaches to some degree, but there's there's just no way for me personally that I could see realistically uh, staying on that medication. It, it just I didn't feel like myself. I couldn't function properly. And I was afraid this might happen. Uh, I had read stories about people who had tried Topamax, realized it wasn't for them. And when they stopped taking it, the headaches kind of came back with a vengeance. And I noticed since I stopped the Topamax, restarted Fluoxetine, basically generic Prozac. And speaking about 
the stigma attached to depression and everything. I, I remember I, I've had uh, nurse practitioners, uh, psychologists or whatever, prescribe a, a wide array of antidepressants for me over the years. And I never really thought twice about, you know, any stigma that might be applied or anything. But probably over a decade now, when one nurse practitioner suggested Prozac, I remember I felt like kind of self-conscious, like Prozac was synonymous with with crazy or whatever. When people thought of psychiatric drugs, Prozac was the drug that came to mind. And all the glib little jokes on sitcoms and everything, you know, that involved, uh, you know, were aimed at people who are mentally unfit often uh, <laughs> included, you know, mentions of Prozac or whatever. And Prozac is actually a great drug. It's, well... Like everyone has their their own unique physiology, and what works for one person might not you know work as well or the same for the next person. But for me personally, Prozac has always been great. It leaves me feeling really natural, like feeling like myself, feeling in a good kind of even keeled place, uh, you know, emotionally, and gives me uh, mental clarity. Um, and even has a bit of a, a stimulating effect that other antidepressants don't seem to have. So it doesn't make you feel like you're on a drug. It makes you, it gives you a very kind of clean, balanced kind of feeling. At least it does for me. But there is that that stigma attached, and I think that Patreon supporter is right when he talks about how we need to destigmatize. Uh, you know, uh, mental and mood disorders. Uh, we shouldn't be, and also we shouldn't be made to feel guilty about taking, you know, psychiatric drugs or psychotropic drugs that actually allow us to function and make us feel more whole or, or you know, make us feel more like ourselves. But anyway, so yeah, I got back on fluoxetine, the generic name for Prozac. And yeah, it's, so it's been at least a couple of weeks now. And unfortunately, uh, well, my mood seems to be good and my thinking seems to be, you know, clear. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you're kind of in the throes of depression or whatever, it can kind of make you feel kind of foggy headed. Your thinking's not as quick and clear as it should be. Uh, mentally, I feel like I'm in a good place. Emotionally, I feel like I'm pretty good too, pretty even keeled. Um, but the headaches have been coming back a little. And I almost wonder if that's because there was some kind of inter, you know, I kind of interfered with the equilibrium I had going with the fluoxetine by introducing the Topamax. And hopefully it's just a temporary thing and I won't have to up the dose of fluoxetine again in order to keep the headaches at bay. It's weird. It's like I'm right on the cusp, right on the edge, because like I said, mentally, emotionally, I feel pretty good, but the headaches are starting to, to come back. They kind of ebb and flow throughout the day, the day. So I'll just have to keep an eye on it and see what happens. Right now, I've been taking, you know, like I always do, a little bit of kratom here and there. <laughs> and that seems to take the kind of edge off the pain or whatever. But okay, enough of that. Uh, wow, that was about a 20-minute long health update. <laughs> I wonder if that tested the patience of even the... Uh, <laughs> the aforementioned Patreon supporter. Uh, that that was a long one. So there was actually a couple of things that aren't really related to atheism or religion at all. That kind of caught my attention over the last couple of days that uh, I wanted to mention on the show. One of them, <laughs> and this is just something I found amusing and I feel guilty for finding it amusing because it has to do with a female officer who I don't, I'm not sure if she was killed in the line of duty or, or how she died, but, uh, you know, all my respect and sympathies go to her and her family. That's not what I find funny, obviously. What I find funny, it's, it's kind of darkly funny. There was this news reporter who just butchered the lady's name, and it's unbelievable how she pronounces her name. And I guess the news station has been trying to pull the clips from all over the place. 
but there's a surviving clip that someone recorded with their phone. And I actually first saw this on um, the H3, H3 podcast. Uh, so I, I guess, I, so I'll, first I'll tell you, the the lady's name is Deirdre. And then it's, I don't know if it's an Irish name or what, but it's this long na- name begins with an M that, you know, in fairness, does seem kind of hard to pronounce. But I'll, I'll play this clip and you can hear what she actually calls the officer. And hundreds gathered today to say their final goodbyes to this fallen Louisville police officer, D.D. Mega Doodoo. <laughs> so, yeah, D.D. Mega Doodoo. That's what she calls the officer. And uh, her na- last name begins with M, but it sounds nothing or looks nothing like Mega Doodoo. Where Mega Doodoo came from, I don't know. I don't know if someone was playing a trick on her with the uh, the teleprompter or whatever. But she went from Deirdre, whatever the, 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 uh, the officer's name is, now deceased. She she reads her name as D.D. Mega Doodoo. So that, that just appealed to my dark, inappropriate, juvenile sense of humor. And once again, nothing funny about the passing of this, this female officer. Uh, you know, th- that should go without saying. But it, it, did t- it did tickle my dark, juvenile, funny bone, the way she pronounced the name. D.D. Mega Doodoo. <laughs> D.D. Mega Doodoo. <laughs> and so once again, given the context, feel kind of bad finding it amusing, but Come on, DD Mega Doo Doo. Okay, anyway, let's move on to something somewhat less juvenile. So the next story involves Jenk Uger's nephew, Hassan Piker. And so basically, uh, he got caught saying something kind of, you know, controversial or inflammatory, and it's been going kind of viral. Uh, here's a clip of what he said America deserved 9 11, dude. F it. I'm saying. Okay, so really short clip, I know, and you're probably wondering what the context was. And it was kind of crunch time when I decided I wanted to include this in the show, so I didn't really have the time to find the complete version and chop it up myself. But there's lots of short little videos featuring the tasty bits on YouTube, which is where I got that from one of those. And to put into context, so... Cenk Uger's nephew, Hassan Piker, is not only a member of the Young Turks, but he's also a fairly popular Twitch streamer, and he's always doing these very long streams. And in this case, he was doing a stream where he was commenting on um, an interview that Dan Crenshaw did. Dan Crenshaw, if you don't know is a young, I I think he's like 35 years old, a Republican politician, uh, former United States Navy SEAL, uh, lost his his eye overseas. I'm just reading this here. It says, while serving in the Helmand province of Afghanistan, 2012, he was injured by the detonation of of an improvised explosive device. He lost his right eye and required surgery to save the vision in his left eye. After the injury, he was deployed to Bahrain in South Korea. And so, yeah, Dan Crenshaw was either being interviewed or making appearance on some political news show. And so I guess, you know, it's safe to say that uh, Hassan took issue with some of the the points Dan Crenshaw was uh, trying to make or whatever. Uh, Didn't quite see eye to eye, no pun intended, (laughs) with him. And so characteristically, Hassan started getting all worked up and said a bunch of edgy stuff. All right. And I should stop for a minute to say that I've been debating whether or not I should continue swearing on the show. And I know I try to, you know, even when allowing myself to swear, I I try to do it in some moderation. Uh, I'm not quite like some other YouTubers or podcasters who just, you know, let themselves off the chain in that regard. Part of it is just me trying to be polite and mindful of the sensibilities of some of my listeners. Since the early days, you know, when I first launched this podcast years ago, here and there I would receive, uh, you know, a message about how people appreciated 
how little I, I swore in contrast to some other atheist uh, content creators or whatever, or they appreciated how, you know, usually I, I, I didn't swear at all. Uh, I know some people actually like the swearing. They like the kind of edgy language. Other people have sensitive ears. And I have to admit the other motivation is more kind of self-serving or less altruistic. Uh, <laughs> I think what goes on with YouTube is not only when you're uploading a video and they're processing it, not only do they scan it for other people's content, but I think they also, if I'm not mistaken, they scan your language and try to detect if there's cursing or, uh, you know, any type of language that might be, uh, let's say, not advertiser friendly in there. And so I was thinking about cutting back on the swearing because of that, too. But in all honesty, my regular podcast episodes, these kind of unscripted, long-winded, long-form episodes, don't really get that many views anyway. So it's not like I'm really going to make any money, you know, money off of them. Uh, the episodes that do the best tend to be the scripted documentary episodes, which obviously, you know, I don't swear in. Um, so it's something I, I'm still mulling over. I, I just thought I'd mention that. And the reason why I brought it up when I did is because I was trying to think how to handle describing uh, some of the other stuff that uh, Hassan Piker was saying. Because after that 9-11 co uh, comment, he goes on to say something about Dan Crenshaw getting, I believe, either skull or eye effed. <laughs> um, by, I think, what he called a quote-unquote brave um, Mujahideen or something like that. And coincidentally, my band used to have a song called Skull F. <laughs> How'd that go? I, I wrote the lyrics. Woke up this morning, sunlight seared my eyes, torn back into this world, this world that I despise. Harsh reality tears deep into my brain, Insanity is just a, just a slender thread away. Something like that, yeah. Cherry stuff. I'm still really proud of some of those old lyrics, despite how over-the-top angsty they may seem. I feel, you know, I spent a lot of time on them, kind of polished and refined them till I got them uh, just the way I wanted them. So, yeah, we should, we should go into the studio and, and re-record Skull F. <laughs> Of course, we don't abbreviate it uh, one of these days. But yeah, so Hassan was saying some pretty edgy stuff. And uh, to be honest, I have kind of mixed feelings about uh, Hassan Piker. I used to be a pretty big TYT fan. I still listen to their podcasts sometimes, still watch their video clips sometimes. And I don't want to sound like a broken record. I've told this story before on the show, but I pretty much started to become kind of disillusioned with them uh, when they started to go after people like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins, uh, when they seemed to become really kind of almost overly sensitive to uh, or protective of Islam in contrast with, say, Christianity or whatever. Uh, I myself, you know, being a non-believer, I believe in criticizing and calling BS on any religion, you know, when it's, uh, d when it's deserving or fitting or whatever, but they did seem to be kind of, they did seem to kind of handle Islam with kid gloves for a while. And they did start to go after Sam Harris, etc. And that's when they started kind of rubbing me the wrong way and I stopped uh, watching them and listening to them as much. But then, you know, not that long ago, I, I finally started to kind of regain some interest in them and started consuming their content more regularly again. And I can remember when Hassan first started uh, appearing on the show and being something of a creature of habit, you know, uh, being a, a bit adverse to change. I'm like, who the heck is this guy? And that's how I always feel with TYT when all of a sudden new faces start springing up. I'm like, oh, I'm used to the uh, the old uh, hosts or commentators. Who's Who are these people, you know? 
And, and it's funny, uh, Hassan, he's a relatively young guy. I forget how old he is exactly. And I th believe he's literally a model. So uh, c kind of uh, a, a young, handsome looking dude. Uh, some people have accused him of being kind of a, a male bimbo of, sh of sorts. Haven't uh, brought this name up on the show in a very long time, but controversial YouTuber, uh, atheism is unstoppable. I believe he, he refers to him, or at least used to, haven't watched him in a while, as Brown Fabio. And of course, uh, he used to refer to uh, Cenk Uger as the, uh, what do you call him, the, the, the big brown buffalo or something like that? Jesus. Fat brown buffalo. I think that I think that was it. Uh, that's even worse. But eventually, Hassan kind of started to grow on me. I got used to him. Uh, even you know, kind of liked him. And then I became aware of his uh, his kind of long form Twitch streams, and I enjoyed kind of watching those as well. Then I noticed he could kind of be unnecessarily kind of nasty or hot under the collar. I remember in particular, he was commenting on the video, this kind of anti-PC girl had made, and I thought, even though I was probably more on his side, I think he just started kind of tearing into her in a nasty way that uh, turned me off, and I noticed that, that kind of pattern with him. And I'm a left-leaning person, but he's uh, really far left, kind of almost militant left, uh, think he might promote or support uh, Antifa, uh, I th really big into kind of communism and things like that. And I'm not some closed-minded, jingoistic person who thinks that communism or socialism, you know, is completely without merit or that it's absolutely evil or something. Uh, a lot of people don't like to admit it, but we basically live in a hybrid system now, which I think is a good thing, you know, uh, this kind of hybrid capitalist slash socialist society or system. Which I like. I think people should be free to pursue their dreams and achieve monetary success. At the same time, I believe in a social safety net. But to be honest, you know, I'm really not big into political science. It's not really what turns me on. So listening to long streams about Marxism or political science in general doesn't really do it for me. And, uh, you know, when people go so far left that they're embracing Antifa and things like that, I mean, you kind of lose me. I mean, it is much as I dislike the Proud Boys and, you know, these kind of thuggish far right movements, uh, I also, you know, I don't think violence is the answer. I don't think putting on masks and acting like thugs yourself uh, and assaulting people is the answer. And I think if you look at the European roots of Antifa, I think, you know, they've had a lot of trouble over there with them and they have a history of violence. So um, just don't dig it. But uh, speaking of TYT, I noticed in my recommended feed or whatever on YouTube, there was a video, a recent video, where Jank interviews Hassan Piker. And I imagine that must be some kind of damage control thing or something. I haven't watched it yet, but I'm kind of looking forward to it. But at the end of the day, I mean, I, I don't really think personally that any kind of really harsh punishment needs to be meted out that the guy should be jettisoned from the internet if such a thing was even possible. You know, um, I believe in free speech and I do think he was saying some kind of edgy, nasty stuff that I wouldn't say, but I don't necessarily think he deserves to be deplatformed because of it. I think, you know, if people have a problem with what he's saying, then I guess do what people are doing, you know, criticize him. Uh, and, uh, if you think he deserves to be punished, you know, unsubscribe to him. Don't watch him anymore or whatever. But I guess at the end of the day, you know, what consequences he'll face uh, for his comments or whether or not he'll be deplatformed, that's really up to, I guess, 
Twitch and TYT. I mean, is is Uncle Jenk gonna fire him for this stuff? Uh, I I doubt it. I haven't, like I said, I haven't watched that that video where where Jenk interviews him. But I imagine, like I said, that's gonna be a damage control type of thing. I doubt his own uncle's gonna let him go. What steps will Twitch take? I, I have no idea. As far as my own personal sensibilities go, you know, I have kind of a dark, edgy sense of humor, and I allow comedy a kind of wide berth, you know, DD Mega Doo Doo, you know, need I say more. But I also, I remember the horror of 9-11. Obviously, I wasn't there. Uh, thankfully, I'm not aware that I lost any relatives or anyone, you know, in 9-11. But 3,000 people, living, breathing human beings who were just trying to go to work and do their job, died horrifically that day because a bunch of hateful fanatics without proper regard for human life decide to turn planes full of people into you know, weapons of devastation. And what always gets me is the jumpers, those people who had to make the nightmarish choice of burning alive or jumping to their to their deaths. I mean, and we have those disturbing images of those people, you know, after they had made the choice to jump, just kind of free falling through the air. And we know what happened to them. I mean, they were finding fragments of bone on, you know, adjacent rooftops. Uh, and, and man, yeah, you know, so even trying to be glib or sardonic, I, I wouldn't jokingly say that uh, America deserved 9 11. Uh, yeah, just, uh, I don't know, man. But I guess on that cherry note, I'll call this episode a wrap. Uh, you guys know the drill. Uh, please like the Facebook page. You can follow the show on Twitter, even though I'm not that active on Twitter. You can check out the YouTube channel. Maybe you're doing that now. And of course, if you want to support the show monetarily, you can go to patreon.com slash theweekendout and support the show for as little as 99 cents a month and quit anytime you want. All right, brothers and sisters, until next time.